Okay, class, welcome back. And today we're going to finish up Chapter 3 with um, Section 7. And today we're going to talk about uh, arguments and truth tables. And so we're going to talk about how do we set up an argument uh, and how do we figure out the validity of, a, of an argument using truth tables and such. So we're going to use truth tables to determine validity, and we're going to also recognize and use forms of valid and invalid arguments. So those are the two objectives for this um, for this section. Okay. So now an argument consists of two parts. The first part are the premises. Now there could be one or more premises to a given ar argument, and these are given statements, statements that may or may not be true or that are assumed. And then there are conclusions, the result determined by the truth of the premises. So an argument is anything that has a set of premises where that follows to a conclusion. Now, arguments can be valid or invalid, and a valid argument is the conclusion is true whenever the premises are assumed to be true. So if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. That would be a valid argument. An invalid argument would be one that is not valid. In other words, the invalid argument contains a fallacy, and a fallacy is just a, a, uh, uh, a an error in reasoning. Okay, and there's different types of fallacies uh, for deductive arguments and inductive arguments. But like I said, we're going to look at forms of arguments, and so we're going to be dealing with more of the deductive. Okay, so we're going to be looking at premises and conclusions. So a set of premises followed by a conclusion is an argument. And a valid argument is where the conclusion is true whenever the premises are assumed to be true. So if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. That would be a valid argument. If that's not the case, then that would be an invalid argument. And the truth tables is a tool that we can use to test the validity of an argument. So the first thing we need to do is be able to set up an argument to be able to use at a truth table. Okay, So testing the validity of an argument with a truth table requires these steps. One, we use letters to re represent each of the simple statements in the argument. Okay, So that means the premises and the conclusion. And then two, express the premises and the conclusion symbolically. And then three, write a symbolic conditional statement of the form where we have all of the premises connected by AND statements and the arrow with the conclusion because what we're saying is that if all of these premises are true then that would imply that the conclusion must also be true because remember implications or conditional statements if the if part is true then the conclusion must also be true. So just like an argument, right? So if all of the premises are true, then it must necessarily follow that the conclusion is true. So this sets up our argument as a conditional statement. So we have all the premises connected by AND, because in order for this piece to be true, all of the AND pieces must be true at the same time. Okay? And then if that's true, then the conclusion must be true. Okay, now, and n is the number of premises, so you can have as many premises as you want, you know, one or more. Four, then we construct a truth table for this conditional statement here. And then finally, if the final column of the truth table has all trues, so in other words, if it's a tautology, then the argument is valid. Okay. If the final column does not have all trues, which means if it contains at least one false, then it is not a tautology and therefore an invalid argument. So in this case here, we have in Star Trek, the spaceship Enterprise is hit by an ion storm causing the power to go out. Captain Kirk, Captain Cook, Captain Kirk wonders if Mr. Scott is aware of the problem. Mr. Spock replies, if Mr. Scott is still with us, the power should be on momentarily. Moments later, 
the ship's power comes back on. So here's the argument. So the first premise is if Mr. Scott is still with us, then the power will come back will come on. The power comes on, therefore Mr. Scott is still with us. That's the argument. <coughs> so we want to test is this argument valid or invalid? So we're going to say if so this is the first premise. This is the second premise. So the first premise is a conditional. The second premise is just a statement. Right? A simple statement. And the conclusion is another statement. Right? So how would we set this up? Well, we have symbols. So step one, we put symbols for each statement. So let's make, let's make P equal Mr. Scott is still with us. Let Q be, the power will come on. Then we go to step two, and we set up our argument using symbolic, sim using symbolic form. So we write the first premise, P implies Q, and then the second premise is just Q. So we set it up as two um, steps, or two rows. And then we have a vertical line, or excuse me, a horizontal line that separates the premises with, from the conclusion. And then this is the symbolic form, the symbol for therefore, okay, for the conclusion. So if this is true and this is true, therefore P. So P implies Q. Then we have Q, therefore P. And so we just wrote it in English, so this is what the argument is. If Mr. Scott is still with us, then the power will come on. The power comes on, therefore Mr. Scott is still with us. Okay, so now we've got it in symbolic form, and this is in English, in words. Now what we're going to do is we're going to write this as a conditional statement, meaning that if this is true and this is true, then P. So this and this together implies P. So this and this together implies P. So this is this, the conditional statement for the argument here. Okay, so this is the same as this. And so now we can test it in our truth table. So let's Construct a truth table, so we have P and Q, so here's our truth values, TTFF, TFTF, then we have P implies Q, so that's one piece of it, so P implies Q, so this is only going to be true, or excuse me, only false when we have T followed by F, so this is false, so it's TFTF, or excuse me, TFTT, then we're now going to take the AND piece, the Q, Right, so P implies Q and Q. So this is only going to be true if both pieces are true. So this is true here. So uh, Q is true. This is true. It's true. False, false, false. True, true, true. False, true, false. So we get TF, TF. Okay, now we do the implication. So this piece is the antecedent. Right? So we look at the antecedent, and we look at P. So we look at this column. So if we have T followed by F, it's false. Otherwise, it's true. So T followed by T, that's true. This is F, so this is automatically true. If T followed by F, ooh, there's a false. So we automatically know that this is going to be an invalid argument. Or it has a fallacy. It contains a fallacy. It's a fallacious argument. Okay, so now, determine if the following argument is valid. Here, it says, I can't have anything more to do with the operation. If I did, I'd have to lie to the ambassador, and I can't do that. So how will we set this up as an argument? Okay, it says, I can't have anything more to do with it. That's the conclusion. Here it says, if I did, if I have anything more to do with the operation, I would have to lie to the ambassador. 
I cannot lie to the ambassador. Therefore, I cannot have anything more to do with this operation. That's the way to set up the argument. So we can express it. If I had anything more to do with the operation, I would have to lie to the ambassador. I can't lie to the ambassador. Therefore, I cannot have anything more to do with this operation. So if we say, if we put this in symbols, how would we write that? Well, I, if I have anything more to do with the operation, so I have more to do with the operation. That could be P. Lying to the ambassador could be Q. So this would be not Q, therefore not P. So it's P implies Q, not Q, therefore not P. So again, so now how do we set this up? Just like I said. So P, we're going to say I have more to do with the operation. Q, I have to lie to the ambassador. And so to write in symbolic form, we have P implies Q, not Q, therefore not P. So this is it in words, right? If I have anything more to do with the operation, I would have to lie to the ambassador. I can't lie to the ambassador, therefore I can't have anything more to do with the operation. Okay? So this is the argument this in this uh, English, right, in English words, and this is in symbolic form. Now we know that to write this as a conditional, we're going to connect these premises with and, and then have an arrow to the conclusion. So this is the antecedent, this is the conclusion. So we would have this and this implies this. And so again, we construct our truth table, right? We start with our P's and Q's, and then we start building our argument piece by piece. So we have the first implication. So we have the first implication, right? P implies Q, and so we can get the truth values for those. And then we have not Q. We get the truth values for those. And then we stick those together. So now we're looking at these two columns with the AND. And remember, AND statements are true only when both component statements are true. So the only one that's true is this one. So the rest are false. We get FFFT. Now we have this. Right now we have the not P because that's where this comes in. And so now we're going to have look at these two columns for the conditional. And so we're going to look for T followed by F. Do we have any T's followed by F? Well, the only T we have is this. And there's this is T. So guess what? We have all true values. And so this is a tautology. And this is a valid argument. In fact, this is called contrapositive reading, reasoning, or this is a valid form called the uh, contrapositivity. Okay, so this is valid by contrapositivity, or we call this contrapositive reasoning. Okay, so now this brings us to the next part, which is the standard forms of an argument. Okay, so there are four valid forms, and there are four invalid forms that you want to memorize or remember. Okay. We have direct reasoning. Okay, direct reasoning is the the um, conditional. Okay, P implies Q. If that's true, so P implies Q. If P is true, then Q must be true. The second premise is well, we have P. Well, if we have P, then the, then the conclusion must we must also have Q. Because if this is true and this is true, well, if we have P then we must also have Q. So this is what we call direct reasoning, or we call this uh, modus ponent. Okay, now here, this is contrapositive reasoning. This is where we have P implies Q, and we say not Q. So think of the contrapositive of the argument. Remember, the contrapositive is equivalent. Okay. The contrapositive of, an, of a conditional is an equivalent statement. So if we have not Q, that would mean not P. So if this is true, then the contrapositive must also be true, which means if we say not Q, then therefore we must have not P. So this is contrapositive reasoning. 
Okay. Now, disjunctive reasoning is also valid. So if we have P or Q, right? So this is going to be true if either one of these is true. But then the next premise is not P. Well, if we don't have P, if not P, if this is true, and we say not P, then it must be the case that we must have Q. So, because one of the two has to be true. Okay, so if we have either one of these, and we say we don't have P, then we must have Q in order for this to be valid. Or in other words, if we say not Q, then we must have P. So either one of these is using disjunctive reasoning. And then transitive reasoning is if we have two conditionals, where we have P implies Q, and then Q implies R, then this would also mean that, therefore, P implies R. So the conclusion is that if you have P, then it automatically will give you R by transitivity. Or in other words, not R implies not P. Because not R implies not Q, and not Q implies not P by using the contrapositive, transitivity of, the, of contrapositivity, okay? So either one of these is fine. So these are the valid forms, okay? This is the modus ponen. This is modus tollen. Okay, modus ponens and modus tollen is the Latin phrase of these. But we can say direct reasoning, contrapositive reasoning, and then this is dis disjunctive reasoning, because it includes a disjunctive, and then transitive reasoning, okay? <clears throat> Invalid forms use the converse and inverse forms, right? So think of the converse and inverse of, an, of, an, uh, of a, a conditional. Remember, those are not equivalent, and therefore these are automatically invalid. So if I have P implies Q, just because I have Q, does not necessarily mean that I have to have P, so it doesn't go the other direction. Remember, converse goes the other direction, so the fallacy of the converse means that just because we have this direction doesn't mean that it automatically goes the other direction. The fallacy of the inverse is similar. If we have P implies Q, and we say not P, well that doesn't necessarily mean not Q. Okay, so if it says, if if it is raining, then the, gra gr the ground is wet, the grass is wet, right? So if, if it is raining, then the grass is wet. If it's not raining, it doesn't necessarily mean that the grass is not wet. The grass could still be wet. Somebody could be watering the lawn, right? So this is not a valid form because the inverse is not always, is not equivalent to the conditional, right? Okay, so misuse of a disjunctive reasoning. So here, P or Q, if I have P, that doesn't necessarily mean I don't have Q because I could have both be true, right? So this is wrong. This is not good reasoning. Uh, and similarly, if I have P and P or Q and I have Q, that doesn't mean I don't have P, again, because I could have both, okay? And then the mis misuse of transitivity is if P implies Q and Q implies R does not mean that R implies Q. It doesn't go the other direction. Okay? So that's the misuse of trans the transitive reasoning. Okay? So now we want to determine whether this argument is valid or invalid. And then we want to define. De identify any sound arguments okay now sound arguments are arguments that are valid right they have to be valid but that are actually in fact where the premises are actually in fact true now so here's a distinction valid arguments are arguments where if 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 the premises are true then the conclusion must be true. But we don't know whether the premises are in fact true. 
it's just an if. So if the premises are all true, then the conclusion must follow, and the conclusion must be true. That's a valid argument. A sound argument is a valid argument where the premises are indeed true. <coughs> so here's the argument. There is no need for surgery. I know this because if there is a tumor, then there is need for a surgery. But there is no tumor. Okay, so we set up our symbols. So let P be there is a tumor, and let Q be there is a need for surgery. Okay, so then we can set up the argument. Okay, if there is a tumor, then there is a need for surgery. So P implies Q. But there is no tumor. So what does this mean? Uh, not P. Okay. And then the conclusion is not Q. So if we express it symbolically, here it is. Here's the words. And here's the symbolically, just like I stated. Now, what form does this have? So it says P implies Q. Now we're saying not P. Does that necessarily mean not Q? And that's false because again this is the inverse right the conditional and the inverse this piece right here we're saying not P then not Q this is the inverse of this and so this is false this is a um, invalid because the fallacy of the inverse okay just because we have not P doesn't automatically mean we have not Q okay Now, draw a valid conclusion from the following premises. So let's say we have these premises. It says, if all students get requirements out of the way early, then no students take required courses in their last semester. Okay, that's one premise. Some students take required courses in their last semester. So what is the conclusion? Okay, so we say if, if all students get requirements out of the way early, then no students take required courses in their last summer. Well, here it says some students take required courses in their last summer. Well, this is the negation of the consequent. Right here it says no students take required courses their last semester. Here it says some students take required classes their last uh, semester. Okay, so these are negations of each other. So if we say if P, so we say P is all students get requirements out of the way early, and Q is no students uh, take required courses in their last semester then this, this here is the negation of that, which would be not Q. Okay, and so we set up symbolically, right? So here's P implies Q, right? Not Q. So if I say not Q, what would be the natural conclusion? What should be the conclusion? Well, if we have not Q, well, think of the contrapositive. If we have not Q, that would mean we would have to have not P. So the conclusion should be not P, which means all students do not get the requirements out of the way early. Okay, or some students do not get their requirements out of the way early. Okay. And so that should be uh, apparent. Okay, so now because the negation of all is some, not, right? we can equivalently conclude that some students did not or do not get their requirements out of the way early. Okay, so now, <coughs> okay, so that's the end of this section, and that ends chapter three. Okay, please make sure that you practice these, that you're asking questions, write down your questions, take notes, and bring those to those questions and your notes to class and we will start 
jumping in. And again, we will tackle this together. And make sure you, you're also practicing and, and working on this suggested homework. Make sure you're keeping up with your own homework and the quizzes and stuff. And then bring those to class. And again, make sure if you have a laptop, bring those to class so we can work, work on those as well. Again, if you have any questions, you can email me, reach out to me, or just ask me in class, and we'll work on it together. Until then, have a great day.